I have. Um, but it is a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And um, actually, the first thing I'd like to do is to celebrate the global nature of our community and to recognize the different time zones we are in. Uh, I'd like you to just share in the chat what you are drinking, and I'll pull that together at the end. Uh, so I'm drinking my morning drink, which is hot water with lemon and honey. Um, so if y'all can just share in your chat what it is y'all are drinking, um, that would be great. So how, uh, this is the agenda for today. We're going to talk about how we got here, who our board members are, what's on the calendar, uh, what's on the calendar, how you can be involved, which is very important, and where uh, we are going. Uh, and then we will, that's going to be very quick, and then we will um, have our presentations with uh, first Dr. Swarna Amalia Ganesh, then Robin Sukaria, and Nancy Pop with Dr. Mesh, and then we will go into breakout rooms. Um, so, uh, is is my screen showing? Okay. Um, so today's agenda will reflect what you can expect from the India Interest Group. We are creating a platform where members of our community can share their work. So Dr. Ganesh is from Chennai, whereas both Robin Sukardia and Nancy Pop are based in Los Angeles. All three of them are Fulbright alumni. Uh, we aim to promote work being done both in the US and India. And so by creating opportunities for connecting with other members of the community is also one of our group's primary objectives. And the breakout rooms will give us a chance at the end to begin making those connections. Uh, future event, we are planning future events, which will be in person, some will be virtual and some will be hybrid. So, um, So before I delineate where the interest, the India Interest Group is going, I must briefly share where we are coming from by stepping back just a few decades. Uh, by the end of World War II, Senator Fulbright realized there was an urgent need to get people to stop thinking about waging war and to think about ways to avoid war instead. So his experience as a Rhodes Scholar had made him realize how culturally transformative it was to be an exchange student. He felt the only way to prevent humanity from self-destructing was by getting people to understand each other, especially from a cultural perspective. So in September, 1945, he introduced a bill in the US Congress to promote, and I quote, international goodwill through the exchange of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. 11 months later, President Harry Truman signed the Fulbright Act, which was fashioned after the Rhodes Scholarship. In 1948, the first Fulbright Exchange participants went to China, Burma, and the Philippines. And just four years later, in 1952, a Fulbright Agreement was signed with India. Since then, there have been more than 20,000 grantees of the Fulbright Program with India. Why is that relevant? Today, the Fulbright Nehru program is a binational program funded by both the US and India. It has become one of the most robust Fulbright programs. There is a synergy between the nations and a recognition of the impact that India and the US have on global diplomacy and on the global economy. So the India, the interest group, the India interest group will embody the spirit of Senator Fulbright's objective by becoming a platform where cultural and intellectual diplomacy is fostered, while being a place for Fulbright alumni to become a part of a community where we can connect and collaborate. So to create that community, we have been working together to develop programs, and I am honored to introduce your board. Um, our two vice presidents are uh, Persis uh, Norman, who will assist me with programming in the US, 
and Rajneesh Gupta, who will be working on establishing institutional connections and supporting grantees in India. Our secretary is Nils Van, uh, Mal Van, Mal Loo, sorry, Nils. Um, the director of events is Cynthia Siegel, director of institutional relations, Megan Ford and Thomas Key. The director of uh, educational outreach is Nancy Pop. Director of Grantee Relations, Lyd Lydia Fisher. Director of Advocacy, Sherilyn Ap Apollard-Durodola. Director of Communications, Sonia Norton. And Director of Service and Volunteering, Kathleen Mulligan. But we all work together as a team and, um, or as multiple teams. And um, we have uh, other board members who are just as key to our effort. So Sandeep, uh, Sandeep Wilson will be coordinating writing workshops. Kansham Haida will initiate our Fulbright in the Classroom outreach. Uh, Xavier Swami Kanu will coordinate the Fulbright Dialogue Series. And Lauren Hershey's, uh, Hershey will assist both the advocacy and institutional relations teams to connect the IIG with think, think tanks and other organizations, especially in DC. And Deodat Roy will be working with our institutional relations team. So it is a, it really is a privilege to work with this passionate and talented, talented team. And uh, so we can create a place where we can make these connections, form this community and foster long-term collaborations. Um, so we are, um, planning, these are the events that we have calendared so far. We are planning two global service days on October 5th uh, of this year to honor Gandhi Janthi and on January 20th of next year. Um, so wherever you are, we encourage you to support peace building initiatives, charitable organizations, community efforts, and social change and share what you do on our social media pages to encourage others. We will hold some in-person volunteering events and encourage you to do so too if there isn't one um, that we have scheduled in your area. It has my screen sharing been paused? Yes, uh, we haven't been able to see any of your slides other than the first slide. Oh. Okay. Uh... Sorry, so how do I, let me go back to share. Is that still not uh, showing? Ah, oh, okay, I, I see that, I am sharing this with Okay, so, sorry. So we have, um, okay, let me just uh, go back quickly. So this is our board. So did y'all not see this slide? No, no, we haven't seen okay. from the beginning. Can you go okay. to the first slide? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so welcome to the Fulbright India Interest Group. <laughs> and uh, this is our agenda for today. Um, I'm just gonna, s and here is this iconic photograph of President Kennedy signing Fulbright Hayes Act. Um, uh, it is a present in presenter mode right now. And it's also in presenter mode. Oh, we see your notes and next slide. Brilliant. Um, how do I stop doing that? You can work, click work. and show. And show. Okay. And just manually. Yeah, now it is. Oh. Single slide. Is it just single slides now? Yes. All right. It's too we're actually seeing uh, your speaker notes. So if you just click the icon, I believe it should be like a screen, um, then it should go the, immediately into presenter mode so that we could see it as the audience thinks. Uh, so what do I click on this? Presenter view. I, uh... Slide show. Yeah, slide. slide show. Okay, so presenter view. Not presenter view. Slide show. Slide show. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Bravo. Okay. But then I won't know what I'm talking about next. Um, okay. So these are our, that's what we're calendaring. 
Um, so these are, uh, in addition to what we have calendared, this, these are additional events and programs that we will be, um, that we have, um, that we are working on. Um, so our retreat in, in the spring is going to, um, sorry. Is this just going, I want to go back to this, okay. Uh, so my, the retreat in spring is being planned in the US this year and um, it, it'll be in spring of next year. But the next retreat uh, we are hoping to plan for uh, will be in India. This retreat is going to be an opportunity for us to uh, connect in person and um, to network and to cross pollinate ideas. Um, we will be offering workshops and also uh, lectures. It's gonna be a two day retreat, um, hopefully sometime in June. Uh, and then I, I'm just gonna to touch on a few things. The Fulbright Dialogues is a very exciting uh, event that we are working on. It's going to be a, an opportunity. Um, there will be discussions and um, conversations on science and technology. And um, that will be, we'll have one conversation, one dialogue in spring, one in summer, one in fall uh, of next year. Um, the writing workshops are um, going to be, we we're going to initiate, we're going to start them this fall. And um, they will, Sandeep, could you just um, fill us in on what those will be, um, the, the three areas that we will be touching on for the writing workshops? We're looking at both a, a, a virtual one-sided approach and an interactive approach that's follow-up for anybody who's involved. And we're looking at certain issues that USIEF particularly interested in. They are a, the formatting and documenting of sources, using sources, documenting references. They want support in writing of, 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 of proposals, grants, and budgeting. And they want support in, um, in plagiarism and academic integrity. We would also like to add a section on AI the ethical use of AI, ethical and pragmatic use of, of AI. So it's, we've, we've added that part, uh, realizing that AI is a, a moving force in, um, in international writing for a lot of people. Thank you so much. Uh, and Sandeep will be heading that. Um, and then the institutional institutions institutional relations uh, team is putting together a database of um, institutions that we um, that will benefit uh, our um, our community um, Tom could you just uh, share with us very briefly the types of institutions you're looking at sure hi everyone um... So we are looking at um, developing some sort of passive matchmaking service, if you will, uh, web-based uh, that will bring together uh, information from government, NGOs, uh, academic and business group institutions uh, so that they can come to this website and look at what's happening in both India and the United States. Uh, and this this is um, this will be a long term project. I think we will start with, of course, surveys uh, to see what all you folks want from the main uh, Indian interest group uh, as far as uh, what kinds of collaboration you may be interested in, what kind of technical uh, areas of expertise, and so forth. So. Um, this will be an ongoing project over a number of years, probably, uh, um, spreading out from the board to the main group to uh, institutions outside of the India interest group. Thank you, Tom. Um, 
All right. So as a community, how can you be involved with the group? Uh, because this isn't just what the board can offer you. Uh, it will be a space where everybody uh, will be participating. Uh, we need mentors for our writing program uh, to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentors for specific areas. So if um, you would like to join, um, you know, to be a mentor, please do reach out to us. Um, we would like hosts for current grantees in the, U in the U.S. Yusuf has this fantastic program uh, in India to introduce uh, and share uh, cultural experiences with grantees in India. And we would like to similarly model a program in the States for uh, grantees in, uh, who have come in from India. Um, we need help with uh, social media. And so our uh, director- Rinalini. Yes. Sorry. Uh, your screen was frozen on my end. I don't know about anyone else, but. I'm on the community page. Is that showing up? Yeah, it's showing for me. You're good. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, um, so, um, so with social media, if you would like to help our director of communications, uh, we would, um, please do let us know. And if you'd like to host a coffee without borders in your city, um, reach out and we will send more information about that. Or Lydia, would you like to just give us a quick, um, introduction to what coffee without borders is? Is Lydia on? Okay, well, we'll, we'll send out more information about that. Um, if you would uh, like to share your knowledge or skill uh, by offering any in-person online classes, definitely reach out to us about that. Um, and a couple of the initiatives that we I have already mentioned would be the service day event. Um, one coming up on October 5th. If you'd like to organize an event in your area, we can help you pull, you know, connect with um, the people from our community who are in that area. And if you would like to start a Fulbright in the Classroom program in your area, definitely reach out uh, to us about that also. So um, before we start our presentations, um i would like to acknowledge um yusuf uh dr um sorry dr das has been incredibly helpful uh in um guiding us and working with us and um being present with us today and um as our other members of yusuf um and also, I believe uh, the, we have at least one Humphrey fellow with us today, Dr. Gopi Ghosh, um, who we uh, look forward to collaborating with um, in the future. Um, so uh, I, I'm done speaking if, uh, and uh, we will take questions um, at the end um, before we go into breakout rooms. Uh, but I would like to introduce you to, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Swarnamalia Ganesh. Um, you have, you all are really in for a treat. She is an amazing, amazing uh, person, um, an artist, an educator. Um, since I don't have my notes here, I am so sorry I can't, cannot introduce you, but uh, if um, we can just go, uh, into her presentation, um, Persis. Hi everyone, I'm going to share the video for Dr. Swarnamalia now. Can, uh, can we just have Dr. Swarnamalia um, 
say hello to everybody and then we can uh, share the video. Sure. Okay. And I'm going to stop sharing. Hello. Am I visible and audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you are. Hello and good evening to everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here amidst other uh, Fulbright alumni. Um, I wish the FIIG the very best. And uh, without much further um, ado, let us move on to the presentation. I'm very happy to be able to make this short performance for this inauguration today. Thank you so much, Mrinalini, Persis, and all others who are involved in bringing this evening together. What city are you in? Chennai. I'm in Chennai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Swanamalia is joining us all the way from Chennai, and we have her pre recorded video to your technical efficiency. Um, I'm going to screen share now and uh, do some settings, so bear with me. <laughs> Do let me know if you are seeing any gray bars. If not, I can go ahead and play. Good evening. I am Dr. Swarnamalia. I'm connected to you from India, Chennai. I wish to start by expressing my joy in being part of this wonderful evening, the start of yet another chapter in the lives of Fulbright alumni, the Indian Fulbright community, and here I speak from experience as a former Fulbrighter myself, feel connected to the world through its long associations as a Fulbrighter. Once a Fulbrighter, always a Fulbrighter. I thank and congratulate in particular Mrinalini, the president of the newly formed FIIG, and Persis, the vice president of FIG, FIIG, both have shown such keen interest in bringing me and my art to this forum as a way to showcase the multicultural work we Fulbrighters are doing and how that in many ways defines the ethos of the Fulbright associations. I'm joined today by two of my students and artists, Kumari Padmasini Ayengar and Kumari Pooja Arbalaji and of course, an efficient team of tech, tech support who've made this possible. We begin, and I bring to you, a piece that is extracted from one of my recent works. I've been dancing on this stage from when I was five years old, always steeped in culture. This dance has always been broadly defined to me as Indian culture. But two decades ago, as a young 20-something, I started to realize that what is defined as Indian culture is in fact a collection of many cultures, including many world cultures. In this diversity and multicultural form lies the definition of my art. This led me to the people who define those cultures. In Sadr, lies the answer to how multicultural the art and the artist are, were, and should be. Through Sadr, we bring to the fore the many peoples who have a stake in this form. We begin with a piece that I have extracted from one of my recent works titled Tamare, an autobiography to Tamil language. Tamil, meaning one that is alive because of its own self. This is the meaning Tamil has, says scholar Camels Velabil. In late prehistoric South India, the Dravidian languages resided. They, of course, moved and met so many other world languages. Alive and with a sense of self, Tamare, who are you? Pirappirkum yella uirkum. By birth, all people are equal. It is their actions that render them unequal. You are music to the ears. Your poetry moves me. But who are you? What should we call you? Dr. Kalengar, 
one of the foremost 21st century Tamil poets, had the same predicament. In his zeal to remain in love with Tamil, he created an entire repertoire of images of Tamil and for Tamil. You are a bird, the moon, you are the mountain breeze, the snow, my love, my beauty. In Bami, Yiniya Tenjale, Paniye, Kaniye, Pasunjole, Maile. These images do not symbolize Tamil, but they evoke the feeling of Tamil. He says, Tamare, I would like to know and learn how to love you. Did he? Let's find out. Tamare.
ಕಿಟಕಿ ಡಂಗ್ ಡಂಗೆ ಕಿಟತಕದೆ ಕೆ ತಾಂ ತಾಂ ಆನಾಲ್ ತಮಿಳೇ ಉಮ್ಮೇ ತಮಿಳೇ ತಮಿಳೇ of Sadar were proficient not only in performance but also in poetry. They mastered the tongue of the patron, be it Telugu, Persian, French, Dutch or English. Here I bring to you a sample of such mastery. A courtesan who was in love with a British officer is bidding goodbye to him. He is off to England after his duration of service in India. In chaste British English, she penned an English padam, or poem, where she sang her woes to him. Tis thy will that I must leave thee. Oh, then, best, beloved farewell. I forbear, lest I should grieve thee. Half my heartfelt thanks to tell. Soon, a British fair shall charm thee. Thou, alas, her smiles must boo. But though she to rapture warm thee, don't forget thy poor Hindu. Penned in the beginning of the 19th century, it was a love poem in the tongue of the English language, but from the voice of a talented Sadr dancer from erstwhile Madras presidency, today's Chennai, South India from where we are connected to you. Don't forget thy poor Hindu. 
to incorporate not just the languages but music as well, the artists of Sadr experimented with Western classical music. Did you know that when George V came to India in 1926 along with Queen Mary, a poet from South India, from Chennai, who lived in southern part, translated the British national anthem into the Sanskrit language. Anyway, greatly inspired also by Celtic tunes, musicians here adapted them into what came to be known as notiswarams, staccato notes played on Indian instruments with swarams. This one that we're going to perform now, in particular, was arranged by Christian Reverend Schwartz, the Danish missionary reverend who was the tutor to Raja Sir Foji II at Tanjavur. Notice for him. Ga 
very much for joining us and watching this performance that we put together specially for you. I'd like to introduce my disciples who joined me today, Kumari Padma. Disconnected. <clears throat> Persis? Persis? Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry. Sunny Iyengar and Kumari Pooja R. Balaji. Mm -hmm. I thank you all and wish the FIIG the very best for its future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh. That was an absolute masterpiece. Um, you, you are, we thoroughly enjoy, a, a, am I on versus? Okay. Yes, you're on. Sorry. Yes. yes, you're on. That is an amazing coalition using Sadar. Um, the, and your performance was so beautiful and so powerful. Um, uh, it, and it completely um, uh, embodies what we want to um, share at uh, with this interest group is that combination of um, traditional and um, contemporary, the combination of both Indian and U.S., so Western and Eastern, uh, the fusion was amazing. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I think um, I could probably say everybody was just as blown away as I was um, by your performance. Thank you so much. Uh, does, if anybody has um, any questions for uh, Dr. Ganesh, uh, we have about five minutes uh, for Q&A with her. I just wanted to know if she ever traveled to 
give a tour to the USA? That's a great question. Thank you so much. You know, strangely, the, the work that I do has taken me to Europe and uh, other countries. Um, we, I have, of course, you know, on the Fulbright, when I came, I had demonstrated parts of my work, uh, but um, a full-fledged uh, work of this uh, particular production and the multiculturality that is yet to come to the US, but um, it's gone to other parts of the country, I mean, other parts of the world. So, yes, that's where we are. Any other questions? I have a question for Dr. Ganesh. Good, uh, good evening, Dr. Ganesh. Um, I'm Nancy Pop. I'm on the board of the Fulbright India Interest Group. And I have a couple of friends who are Bharat Natyam dancers also. So I'd be absolutely um, thrilled to show them your video. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any possibility of sharing it with them. Uh Thank you, Dr. Nancy. It's um, wonderful to meet you. Um, of course, I mean, I'd be very happy to uh, share uh, excerpts of uh, the videos and my work with you. At, maybe I'll take your uh, contact on, yeah, on the message, and I'm most happy to share. I think the message uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I'd like to, that I wanted to share both in this group and at large is that uh, these forms that we practice as traditional forms are multicultural inherently. And it's so important and critical, particularly at this time, to share it in that light, because then, you know, we expand the scope of a dialogue between communities through these arts. Uh, I have a quick question, beautiful performance. Um, is this called a Lalana then? Uh, no. So, oh, my lovely Lalana, the second piece that you saw, the English piece, these are all part of what we unearthed as company compositions, company as in the, you know, the colonial, right? So uh, there were a small um, re re repert repertoire of company compositions that were created by uh, musicians as well as courtesan dancers. And uh, they are left in the memories of only the hereditary community because I, I had the fortune of learning under uh, mm -hmm. hereditary uh, artists. You know, I inherited a few of it. But the one that you saw is like, oh, my lovely Lalana. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is a whole new piece, which I was able to find in one of the uh, India office documents in London, actually, quite strangely. And so I brought it back. And we don't know the name of the courtesan, but the poetry is here for us. Very nice aspect and truly meeting the spirit of Fulbright. I have a comment to make. May I make it? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, are you aware um, of the fact that about two weeks ago at Lincoln Center in New York City, there was India Week? Does anybody who's a New York City person, I happen to attend many of the events and I'm just wondering if our presenter was aware of the emphasis that they had on all the performing arts from, from India. Any, was anybody else from New York City at that event? Thank Any you, Carol. Um, that, yeah. that is good information um, to have and we should watch out. And I think that is something that we can share with this group also is um, just information about uh, events like this in the various cities um, that we have, uh, that that we're based in. Okay, thank um, you. And especially, you know, when uh, there are performances or there's um, work being done, or sh uh, we're happy to put that on our social media pages also. And um, so that we know about other, um, writers who are performing or presenting. Uh, I mean, the community finds out about them. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, introduce our next um, Fulbrighter who will be presenting today. Uh, let me just share my screen. So our uh, our next um, 
presenter is Robin Sucardia. He is, um, he's my tabla teacher also. Um, and um, it's been an absolute delight to have um, met him. And um, he studied under um, Maestro Pandit Shokun Choudhury. Uh, his special f uh, focus is on the musical traditions and rhythms of South Asia. And um, he has um, created musical arrangements and compositions on a wide range of concert, film, and album productions. Um, he has traveled internationally on behalf of Project Ahimsa, an organization which was com uh, committed to empowering impoverished youth through music education. Um, and so his work uh, led him to earning his Fulbright uh, Senior Research Award in India. And uh, it was focused on bolstering six music education programs across India and Nepal, each serving children in some of the poorest regions and communities in South Asia. Uh, and a major outcome of his research period was the successful production and international tour of Ekatva, which featured 16 street children from the slums of Ahmedabad. Ekatva means oneness in Hindi, and it presented Mahatma Gandhi's message of non-violence and tolerance, but in a dance drama format. Um, Robin? Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes? Um, Absolutely. I say thank you, Mrinalini. I really appreciate this introduction. And oh my gosh, Dr. Ganesh, I was so moved by your performance. And I think it's a perfect segue to uh, what I hope to share with you here. Um, we just got to hear an incredible um, hear and, and witness dance from South India. And so what I'm excited to share with you here is the instrument, tabla which is representative of North India. Um, this instrument is, is the heartbeat for me. It's, it's a portal to the spirit realm. It has a lot of healing quality and a lot of healing power. Uh, and at the core of all the things I do, it's really a connection uh, through this instrument to, to be able to heal and to send positive vibrations. Um, and so I, I think anyone can agree that if you hear tabla, whether you understand it or not, it, it, it definitely has an uplifting quality to it, like most instruments um, in South Asia. Uh, I can't proclaim it's going to cure the COVID or cure the common cold or any of that, but I, I certainly think it will expand uh, consciousness. And that's my real reason for studying this instrument. So what I wanted to do first is just play for you. Uh, I'm based here in Los Angeles. Uh, I saw someone asking, what is Southern California? Well. Los Angeles is kind of the core of Southern California. Um, I, I live here and I study tabla at the Ali Akbar College of Music and at the uh, California Institute of the Arts. So we'll begin a little bit. Let me just play for you and then um, I'm going to go into a little bit of a history and context of this gorgeous instrument. Da, din, gra, din, ge, da, tet, da, 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 din, din.
ta da ge na ta ge di na ge na te te ta te te ta ge na te te ki na da ge tu na ke na ta ta ke na ta ke ti na ke na te te ta te te ta ke na te te ge na da ge di na ge na ta. Thank you. So this was just a little bit of a taste of um, this gorgeous instrument, which we call tabla. And I just wanted to give a quick overview of this. And there's lots of ways. To, it, it could be an entire day of exploring what this instrument really is all about. But on the right hand, you have the actual tabla. And the tabla represents the female, uh, the higher frequencies, the energy of the treble. On the tabla itself, you have so many different notes. Na, tete, tun, tin, tak, dere, dere. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the baya. This is the, the bass drum, and it represents the male uh, frequency, the, the bass, the lower end of the spectrum. And here you have the beautiful modulation of the bass. Both drums uh, have a very important feature, and that is this black spot. Uh, tabla sounds like a bell. It has that quality of, a, of, a, of metal. And that's exactly what this uh, black spot is made of. It's iron filings, rice paste, and water. This is one of the only drumming traditions in the world that has this concept of a gob. That's what the name of this black spot is, affixed to uh, leather. And that's why many people confuse tabla with bongos uh, when they see them, because they look small and you know they seem to be two drums. But bongos are very different, uh, and primarily because of this black spot, but also for the fact that the bottom of the drum, there is no hole at the bottom of the drum. And the strap that goes around is a single piece of leather, just like your shoelace. So tabla, and I'll get to this in a little bit. I'm going to show a little bit of how this instrument is actually made. But the biggest part of tabla is the language, which you got to hear uh, just now. Uh, language is crucial to, to learning this instrument. Before you ever touch the drum, you first have to learn how to speak the language. On the screen here, I'm sharing um, an image of the tabla on the right. And you can see the two drums there. You also see a hammer. A tabla player's best friend is a hammer. The hammer is there to tune the drum. Um, there's also a little, it's hard to see there, but there's a little uh, uh, round circular case. That's actually baby powder. Um, I'm carrying baby powder like this, but uh, typically we use baby power, powder to, uh, to reduce friction on the head of the drum so that we can move quickly on the surface. Now on the left hand side, what you see here is the grandfather of tabla, and this is the pakawaj. Now uh, the pakawaj uh, is a two-sided barrel drum with both the treble and the bass uh, on, on both ends. So you can imagine tabla being connected by a single piece of wood. Uh, and so while the history of tabla is 
you know, because this is an oral tradition, we don't exactly know precisely how the tabla evolved, but we do know that it has connection to the Pakawaj. And, and the, the main reason is, is that um, the Pakawaj language, some of the phrases uh, are, have been adapted to tabla. You can also see structurally the drum on the left-hand side looks kind of like tabla. It has the strap, it has the pegs, it has the black spot. Now, uh, older versions of the Pakawaj, they didn't even have the black spot. They just had dough, uh, literally kneaded dough that was stuck onto the side of the drum. Um, and there are, you know, uh, what I love about Dr. Ganesh's uh, presentation is that we got to hear the mridangam. The mridangam is a similar uh, designed instrument, but it's in the south of India. And it's actually quite, quite a bit older than the Pakawaj. The Pakawaj was really prominent in the, the Mughal courts. Uh, and you got to see that instrument uh, accompanying dance. Not Bharat Natyam, but Kathak. Kathak is the primary dance form of North India. Um, so now the, the tabla acquired its pegs and the multi-surfaced head from the Pakawaj, and that allowed for more varied sound production. And in the 19th century, uh, with the rise of Kayal music and sitar and instrumental music, um, this became the favorite drum for accompaniment mostly because of the fireworks. Uh, tabla is a very dynamic instrument because of the posture and the way we sit with the instrument. Um, it allows for a lot more of a dynamic uh, accompany of much more energy. And that was a reflection of the evolution of raga. Whereas before that time, uh, because the music was much more focused inside the courts, it was not accessible to the, the, the public. Um, that music was designed to be performed and and received in different ways in a much more smaller context inside the courts of the Mughal Empire. Um, but as the instrument started to break free, thanks to you know the British coming to the United to to India and and um, pushing so much of the culture uh, from Delhi to Kolkata, the instrument started to come out into the public. Um, and as you can see, the instrument is very small. Uh, and before the advent of microphones, you really had to be close to it to listen to it. But now, uh, as the instrument continues to evolve uh, and microphones get more sophisticated, you're able to hear all those very intricate details of the, of the sound. So I wanted to share that with all of you. I also wanted to give everyone a little bit of a background on what are the similarities of Indian classical music and Western classical music. Uh, and I also, again, love Dr. Ganesh's performance uh, because we got to hear the adaptation of Western classical music uh, into South Indian um, modalities. And so both forms of music evolved out of the patronage of the ruling classes. Uh, so the aristocracy of the West uh, in Europe, I'm talking about, and then the aristocracy of, of India, South Asia, the Mughal Empire, these are the places where musicians could practice and perform for hours and hours a day in a very refined environment. So they developed lots of rules and grammar. Uh, and so both of these traditions of music have that co in common. Uh, as I say in the second one, there's also performance technique. You know, There's a lot of rules as to how you present the instrument. Some of that I showed you in my introduction. We start with uh, tintal, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a moment but we, we start very simple and then we fill in with actual traditional compositions. Everything I played uh, for you was taught to me by my teacher. So this is not entirely improvised. There's a lot of rules and a lot of grammar. Both Western classical and Indian classical music have seven basic musical notes, which are called swaras in Indian classical music. And then there are accidentals like sharps and flats and other naturals in Western classical music as well as Indian classical music. And then lastly, you have to have focused study from a master teacher to really learn and develop the technical proficiency in both traditions of music. Now, what are the differences? Um, well, Indian classical music is homophonic. What does that mean? Well, there's a focus on a single note. Uh, you don't have chords when you strum a sitar uh, or a sarod or any of the Indian instruments. You focus on a single note and its relationship to the next note. Uh, Western classical music, by, on the other hand, is polyphonic, which means you have chords, you have harmony, and you have texture of multiple voices, choirs, orchestras. Those are not necessarily concepts that are uh, in, 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 in core to Indian classical music. In Indian classical music, there's a lot of improvisation. Once you're learning all of the rules, of course, you can break the rules once you learn the rules. Uh, but we're, we're, we're not taught 
in Indian classical music about writing things down and having notation. It's all really coming from the heart and from feeling. Whereas in Western classical music, there's compositions and there is notation. As you all know, you can read Western classical music. Um, on, on Indian classical music, the voice is the central aspect of the music, which is why you heard me reciting uh, the, the, the notes of tabla. It's really about the voice. Uh, whereas in Western classical music, it's really about voice and instrumentation. Voice is not the central aspect. Solo performance is really emphasized in Indian classical music, whereas ensembles are emphasized in Western classical music. You have complex rhythmic cycles that frame the musical expression. That's what tabla provides. It provides a frame uh, of, of time in which the other uh, accompanying musician can improvise. Whereas in Western classical music, there are fixed measures of time based largely on three, four, 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 six, eight time signatures. Indian classical music is microtonal. And what does that mean? Well, when you go from one note to the next, there's a lot of bending. Lots of tiny, tiny notes to get from one to the next. Whereas in Western classical music, if you look at a piano, you just step up to the next half step or the whole step. You don't spend time in between bending notes. Um, dissonance is not encouraged in Indian classical music. There's a lot of focus on purity of sound. Uh, another reason why tabla is, um, is uh, um, tuned, instruments are tuned very, very precisely. Uh, whereas in Western classical music, yes, we do tune, but there's also a lot of use of dissonance, uh, you know, tritones and, and, and notes that cause tension that end up resolving. Um, and then lastly, Indian classical music is deeply connected to nature. Uh, the cycles of time, the day, and, and the cosmology of the stars. Uh, whereas Western classical music, the secular side of Western classical music is rooted in individual experiences and historical events. For example, you know, orchestras were uh, composing certain pieces to commemorate you know, Napoleon's uh, victory or something of that nature. Michael. <clears throat> so I wanted to play a little bit more for you and uh, share with you a little bit more about what I was speaking earlier, which is the language of tabla. What you have here up on the screen is called tintal. Tintal is what all tabla players and all actually instrumentalists learn first. It's a cycle of time that represents 16 beats. And it sounds like this. Da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, det. A din, din, da, da. And then we go back, back home. Home is called sum. And the way that Indian musicians and tabla players are able to very quickly play with other musicians is that we all know that this is kind of the frame of time. So we're always coming back home to sum. And whether you're looking at this or counting the beats, your ear will know it's time to come home. Let me play that again for you a little faster. Da, din, din. Da din din da da din din da te te din din da and da din din da da din din da da. Now the reason that's uh, marked blue here is that that is called kali. Kali means empty, empty of what? Empty of bass. During those four notes, there is no bass. And that helps prepare the ear for coming home. Da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, da. So you can kind of see how this music um, has such a beautiful amount of structure within it, but so much of it is, is opened up so that the listener can just enjoy and understand where they are in the music. Um, let me play just a little bit more for you. Uh, before I show you a little bit more about how these drums are made. Again, we'll talk about tintal. Da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, tete, din, din, da, da, tete, tete, gen, taka, din, and nana, gen, gen, and nana, gen, din, and taka, din, and nana, gen, taki, ta, taki, ta, taka, taka, din, and nana, gen, and dara, gen, naga, din, and naka, din, and naka, ta, 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 gen, and naka, din, and naka, dara, gen, naka, din, and naka, din, and naka, gen, kira, taka, tere, kita, naga, din, and naga, gen, dara, gen, naga, din, and naga, din, din, and gen, da, din, gen, din, din, da. This is a composition that I was taught by my teacher. Ta, 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 ta
So that is just a little bit of a, a, a more of a practical kind of showcase of how tabla and tintal are connected. Um, let me show you now uh, a little bit more about the connection between North and South uh, Indian music. Um, and again, Dr. Ganesh, thank you so much. You, you set this up so well for us um, to see how this uh, works. Um, so the here we have a map of South Asia. And I, again, I like to call it South Asian. If it was up to me, it would be South Asian classical music, because as we all know, India is a national construct from 1947 onwards. It, beforehand, you had the entire subcontinent, and music in North India is a product of the combination of the existing culture blending with the Persian invasions that came through Afghanistan and present-day Pakistan into North India. Uh, the Mughal uh, empire, the culture there is a hybrid culture that brought the, the, the Persian culture and combined it with the existing culture. So, so really classical music, Indian classical music in the north, Hindustani they call it, evolved out of the Mughal court system of patronage, which I mentioned earlier, from the 1500s onwards. Instruments like sitar and tabla are the dominant instruments, and katak is the primary dance tradition. Now, this is just a, a line through the middle of India. So now we go to South India, which we got to hear from Dr. Ganesh, is more purely, I would say, Hindu because it never, uh, it wasn't invaded the way it was in the north. The, the south remained a, a much less hybrid culture. Uh, so classical music evolved out of the temples uh, and the patronage of Hindu priests rather than an aristocracy like the Mughal emperors. Um, the music is structured and regimented around time signatures, and instruments like veena, violin, and mridangam are dominant. And as we saw earlier, Bharat Natyam is the primary dance tradition. So these are the two big areas. Indian classical music is not monolithic. It's not one culture. North and South India are very, very different. Um, and we can also talk about food in another lecture, but we all know that the food is very different from both. Now, I'll end with uh, giving you a little bit of a picture into what tabla, how is tabla made? Uh, so what you have here is the, the tabla skins are being prepared before the, the gob is affixed to the head of the drum. You can see actually there are two skins with a circle cut out uh, on the, the, the top layer. So you have two skins, and, and if you look at tabla here on my screen, you'll see that there's actually a lip that goes around the drum. Another important aspect of the, of the drum is that typically the head of this uh, drum is made of goat skin. Uh, you have camel skin that makes the straps and then cow skin for the braiding. So uh, many tabla have three different animal skins that make uh, it it's con uh, comprise its construction. Why? Because each type of skin has different stiffness and different flexibility. Uh, the skin is paper thin, uh, very delicate. Uh, a pencil could puncture the top of the tabla. Um, now here you see the gob being prepared. It's very rough here, but you can see it's just a black powdery substance put on the top of the drum. Now here's the actual, uh, here's, here's a uh, cow skin uh, being prepared. Um, this is what the drum looks like if you take the head off. It's a hollow, uh, it's hollow inside, but look, there's a bottom. There's no hole on the bottom. Uh, and I mentioned that about how bongos have, have, uh, have no enclosure at the bottom. So tabla, and this particular drum here is a mahogany wood. Different kinds of tabla have different wood compositions, and that affects the, the sound. 
Uh, this is a tabla maker in Kolkata. This drum that I'm playing was made in his shop. Uh, if you travel around North India, you will see drum makers like this sitting on the side of the road, um, making these incredible instruments. And you have to remember about the gob that, that like many things in India, it's handed down from father to son, the recipe, the recipe for making the black spot. So the tabla is a, is, is a, it, it's a, and, and the families guard that recipe like very, uh, you know, they, they're very proud of that recipe because that determines the quality of the sound. Um, so here you see this tabla maker uh, preparing the skins and one drum is outside drying in the sun. Now, these are clay pots. Uh, here on the baya, you see it's made of metal. Mine is made of metal, but originally the baya was made of matka or clay. Uh, and the matka sounds actually way better than the metal, but the problem is they're really fragile. They're not going to survive getting tossed uh, onto an airplane. Uh, so before tabla was really able to e expand beyond North India, it had to be, the innovation had to be uh, in the, the manufacture of the shell. Now, this is the metal iron filings and water being prepared uh, before it actually go, turns into a, a bit of a, a, a mash. And then they, uh, you can see the tabla maker is doing this right there with his feet, just preparing this recipe and then soaking a little bit of rice in water and then mixing that with glue onto the drum and basically putting a little bit of rice. And you can see the couple of rice pieces there. And then they start using their finger and they just start going round and round with the black uh, metal uh, iron filings. And so uh, thank you so much for, for listening to all that. I appreciate being here uh, and I, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Robin. That was very, very informative and love listening uh, to the sound of the tabla and you uh, played so beautifully. Um, any questions? Uh, Lauren Hershey has a question. Thank you, Lauren. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my Fulbright was served um, on an ashram just south of downtown Calcutta, Ramakrishna Mission. And uh, I would get downtown for all night concerts, start at eight in the evening and end at seven or eight in the morning with many settings. I was introduced to the tabla. I don't know if there was a microphone in the room. I can't remember uh, in auditoriums in downtown Calcutta when it was called Calcutta. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, though, is have you come to Washington, D.C. to perform? And if not, why not? And if, I, so, and if so, when will you do it again? <laughs> well, thank you for that great question. Uh, I, I used to live in North Carolina, so I've been to D.C. many times. absolutely love the, the city. Um, I do a lot of electronic music as well outside of my classical uh, tabla study, and I have performed in D.C., not on tabla, but more of a hybrid, using tabla as a part of my electronic music. Um, I, I think Washington, D.C. is just an awesome community. There's so many South Asians there, but also people who are not South Asian and who love this music. So I hope to return again soon. It's been a while, but uh, thank you for, for reminding me that I need to come back. Just a comment. Thank you, Robin. Uh, listened to many of the performances, but uh, didn't really know how the tablas are made. And uh, what you presented today is extremely educational. Now I'm looking at my own tabla fitting the <laughs> decoration piece in my living room. And now this will give me more interest in going and you know start using them. Awesome. Wow. Wow. Yes, your instruments should not be on a shelf. They should be brought to life. So definitely give it some love. And I'm glad, I'm glad I could in enlighten everyone. You know, I'm fascinated by how these instruments are made. I, I, uh, I, I study the instrument, but it's really the people who make these instruments that, that are just absolutely fascinating. Their families, the craftsmanship, and their focus. Uh, so I'm glad that you, you enjoyed that. Um, just a comment. Uh, it was a magnificent, so Robin. And though you sounded it very, that is a sort of effortless. But I can promise you one thing: I tried it for, it, and I never went beyond this path. Uh, so you can understand. Yes. Thanks, thanks for a wonderful show. 
Well, at least you got uh, da, dun, and na. These are the fundamental strokes of tabla. Um, my favorite strokes, da, dun, na, na, di, na, da, dun, na, da, di, na, da, na, 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 I hope you go back to it. Don't forget the language. One last, oh, sorry, sorry, Robin. Okay, one last question, yes. One last question from Tom. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, that was really great and very informative. I had a question about the construction of the tabla and regional differences because of the wood that was used. Do you, yes. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, absolutely. So actually, that's a good thing. I have I have this additional drum here. You, let me, uh, you can see this, I think. This is another tabla. You can see the, the, the wood is different. Um, and this drum is actually larger. So this one came from New Delhi. Uh, and it sounds like this. And listen to this. So uh, the Delhi drum uh, is made of rosewood, and this one is made of mahogany. Um, now the pitches are different. That's that's obvious. But the crystalline quality of the the, the makers in Kolkata is very different than the way Delhi tablas are made. And why? Because in in Kolkata because at least my, my lineage is the Lucknow tradition. Now Lucknow has a very heavy hand. Like Tete, Tete is played with all three fingers. In Dili, they play it with two fingers. It's a lighter touch. So the drums are made slightly different because the actual way that these different tabla players perform is different. Uh, you know, uh, and again, this is a big topic, but in this system of music, they're called garanas, they're houses. There are different garanas of music depending on the city. Benares has a Benares garana, and it's a different style of compositions and playing. Dili has its own style. Um, Zakir Hussain, for example, is from the Punjab garana. My guru, Shapan Chaudhary, is from the Lucknow garana. So these cities, before the British came and kind of really dispersed everyone, they had individual styles of making and playing tabla. Thank, Thank you. you. Doug, do you have a really quick question? So that because we still have one more uh, presentation. Uh, no, uh, that's fine. You can move on. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you put it in the chat and we will uh, address it? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, re I'm really, really sorry because it's getting really late in India. Also, um, I, I just want to put in a quick plug for Robin as Nancy. I mentioned in the chat, Robin is performing in LA today. I mean, well, in Southern California. So um, if you are in the area, uh, you can definitely, you definitely should visit the Festival of Tabla. Um, our next um, perf uh, performance, uh, a presentation is by Nancy Pop. Uh, Nancy is an artist, an educator, an activist. And her practice centers around a core of performance works and direct political interventions, exploring relations between bodies, the situational context enveloping them, and the nodes inter interconnecting them. Nancy, I'm going to keep this really short uh, because she is also being joined uh, by Dr. Umesh Nayak, who is an alternative art practitioner, art researcher, and educationist who is based in Bhubaneswar. Uh, Orissa, oh, oh, sorry, Odisha, sorry, I'm used to saying it, Orissa. Um, and he works with local tribal communities on the environment and uh, on ecology. Um, so, uh, Nancy, uh, if um, you can go ahead. Yes, if everyone else could mute, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Good morning and good evening. Um, I'm very happy to be invited to present. And Robin, Faya, I'm so happy to see your presentation. Um, I actually play the Pakavaj, and Robin and I played together at some point in the past. It was many years ago. But it's wonderful to see him, and I hope to see him in person later today. Um, I am very honored to be joined by one of my collaborators in India, Dr. Umesh Nayak, and I just want to make sure that he's here on the Zoom and that he can hear me and that we can hear him. Are you with us, Umesh? Yeah, he's Yes, yes, yes. Huh, okay, good, good. Um, so I, um, I had the privilege, I'm just going to 
we're going to alternate back and forth, Dr. Nayak and I. Um, I had the privilege to go to India in 2022 and 2023 and met Dr. Nayak. I um, am a performance artist and an educator of over 20 years uh, based in Los Angeles. And Dr. Nayak is also an artist and uh, uh, an organizer and a writer and a festival coordinator. He's, he's a curator. He's wonderful. He's based in Bhubaneswar um, at the Utkal University of Culture outside of Bhubaneswar and previously in Delhi. Um, and so we met and we have continued um, to work together since we met in India and are hoping to uh, form a residency for artists in India uh, in the future. We had attempted to do that in Delhi, but now we are trying to do it in uh, possibly in Bhubaneswar or in Calcutta. So uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of our connection, which was um, formalized through a festival that Dr. Nayak organized in um, in Orissa, outside of Bhuvaneshwar, at the Fakir Modan University, which is uh, an amazing university located in the heart of rural Orissa and is um, attended by, I think, a very high percentage, almost half of the attendees are tribal affiliated persons. Um, so I'm going to start with a uh, keep this slideshow as brief as possible to give us time for Q&A at the end. Um, let me just uh, coordinate to make sure that this is viewable and I will share my screen. Let's see here. All right, please do let me know if everyone can see that. Uh, excellent. Yes. Um, so this is Dr. Nayak and I. Um, and we were at the Ururum Festival. It was in November of 2022. Um, I was invited uh, during my Fulbright. I was a professor at Vishwabharti University in Shantiniketan at Kalabhavan. And my specialty was public art and performance art and political activism. Um, I will post my, um, I'll post my uh, Fulbright Scholar profile in the chat a little bit so that you can see a little bit of what I was doing. But this is uh, Dr. Nayak and I on the main stage at Unurum, which was the festival that he coordinated in late 2022, which was an international festival. It, it included film, dance, um, poetry, um, uh, performance art, um, visual art, photography, uh, exhibitions. It was absolutely breathtaking and a lot of it was coordinated with the tribals and their cultures and folk traditions so dr nayak maybe you would introduce yourself now and give a brief example or explanation of who is with us in this photo yeah uh, yes yeah uh, uh, yeah i'm actually uh, working in uh, uh, visual art but uh, in the eastern side of India, this is a lake of our contemporary practices. That's why I think about the collaboration with all creative uh, peoples and uh, make some improvement uh, with the contemporary style. So, but uh, before I only uh, work with the, the tribal communities, especially in Mundari communities. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, I think this a uh, uh, community practices should be us in the eastern side. So this is the aim of this uh, festival, and uh, uh, this uh, this is a, a totally non cooperative festival which promotes rural art, folk dance, language, and literature, along with the contemporary practice like ecological art, community art. Uh, this is the main base, and Unrum word is a uh, originated from the Mundari tribal community oral tradition. The meaning is identity, and uh, the festival, uh, the festival is the community identity, distinguished characters or personality and individual uh, individuality, which relations established by the social, cultural, psychological identification. 
it would not to be a limited to a specific religions, but it will be the part. But participation from the national international arena, which would be aid to be the richness and make it extra uh, ventures. It is uh, it is a folk art, folk dance, literature, languages concerning this new set of promotion, preservation, and exposition. Actually, this is the main uh, motto of these festivals. Mm, Dr. Nayak, would you tell us about this gentleman in the photograph with us? Yeah, he is, he is the Niranjan Kuntia. Uh, uh, he is the, the whole life he is uh, uh, promoting the tribal communities uh, uh, and he is living also uh, with the communities. He has uh, he also an educationist. He has a uh, he's running a school with the, with the private kids. Uh, I think uh, the hundred to hundred ten uh, private kids are uh, um, learning the, in his school, and he also collecting use uh, uh, number of oral words, oral traditional words of tribal communities, and he make uh, the. Uh, poem and uh, piece of the, uh, the poem form. I and he also, or I and uh, he, uh, the collaborative uh, publication we did. This book is Johan uh, Alam. Uh, this is the collection of uh, uh, 60 poems. And uh, now he also working with the tribal communities with their uh, language assembly. And he was also um, helping to organize part of this uh, festival, correct? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, is there anything else you wish to say before I uh, talk about the uh, the work that the students and I did from Vishwabharti? Yes, yes, please. Gotcha. Okay. So um, this is some of the uh, other festival presenters at Unurum with some of the contemporary artists there. And one of the amazing things about this festival was uh, Mr. Nayak had organized um, some very prominent contemporary performance artists, some very prominent contemporary visual artists across India to come. And we worked and presented alongside with the tribals, uh, tribal people who were in the region and uh, presenting also at the festival. So this is an image of some of the curators from uh, Delhi and Kolkata and artists from Gowati and Bangalore um, who are posing with some of the dancers um, alongside who performed at Unurum with us. It, there was a beautiful um, uh, combination of local culture and uh, interstate uh, contemporary culture at the festival. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of the some of the activities were shared <clears throat> and the local people shared a lot of their cultural traditions with us, with the contemporary artists as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so one of the things that was interesting about my participation in this is that I was invited as an artist um, on my own, as a performance artist, uh, to perform on a day with all other performance artists from across India, many of whom I knew. Um, and I told Mr. Nayak that I would come uh, if I could bring my students from Vishwabharti. I wanted to give them an example or uh, come alongside of them and actually teach differently than the traditional Indian model, which most people will hold up their practice and, um, and students will emulate their practice and copy their practice and learn from them by copying kind of in a guild model. And I'm a much more hierarchical or non-hierarchical horizontal teacher and my pedagogy, I've studied radical pedagogy for many years and I prefer to work alongside my students. So what I proposed to Mr. Nayak was that I would come to the festival if my students and I could come together and we would make a performance piece that was collaborative and that they would perform in with me. So these are the students from Vishwabharti who uh, came with me from my graduate and uh, BFA classes. There was one BFA that came with us, he was very brave, and the rest were master's students. And they, uh, they were from multidisciplinary um, 
departments across Calabavan's campus. So we traveled together to Orisa. We spent several weeks beforehand um, conceiving of a work uh, solely motivated by their own ideas. And then I would shape and help guide them into creating an actual performance work. So uh, together we created this uh, project and then we traveled to Orisa together and stayed there for several days and presented it in the context of all of these other international and um, well-known performance artists across India. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity that Mr. Nayak gave us and gave the students to actually immerse themselves in the culture and work with contemporary artists across India. Um, and there were also musicians, dancers, poets. So it was a really rich experience for the students. It was uh, many of them it was the first time they'd ever created their own work in a public context like this. Um, and so imagine if you when you were in school, you had this opportunity. It was really it was a wonderful chance. And I'm really grateful that Mr. Nayak, uh, Dr. Nayak gave us this um, opportunity. So this is a group of the of us at a pre uh, festival meeting all together, many of the artists gathered together and just discussing and introducing ourselves and just deciding what we were going to do. So, uh, Dr. Nayak, would you um, mind to just introduce some of the other performance artists briefly, uh, maybe just a few sentences on each one as I um, show the slides? Dr. Nayak, would you mind to give a little information yes, about yes about each of yes. the artists that you chose? Yeah, uh, this is Dimpal uh, Sahas from Bangalore. And uh, uh, she, uh, be before the performance, she uh, uh, works up with the all private communities, which are women from the system side. And she uh, collects some, uh, how, the, uh, how the people uh, respect their land and uh, forest and uh, natural resources. Uh, then, she performed uh, all natural uh, mediums collected, collected from them. Uh, this is the image of the of mass. See, uh, all natural elements they use. Uh, this is a evil side. And this is an unborn psyche. It is basically from the northeast side and Assam. He did a uh, yeah. He is the, uh, you know, this is, this is the unborn psyche, the, as, from Assam. Yeah, he did the uh, performance like uh, with uh, urbanization and ruralization, the connection with the urbanization and ruralization, with the festival, uh, the, this is the performance. And uh, this is the sanskar. Uh, he did the uh, the uh, performance uh, with uh, some language, some words like uh, uh, rural words he collected from uh, his Bible and the performance uh, in front of uh, the phone and outside of uh, uh, this this is the ritualistic behavior of uh, uh, rural areas. He did the performance. Uh, she is uh, Diana Mahapatra, which is basically from India, uh, from Odisha. And she did the performance uh, how women uh, uh, in, in our literature, women are uh, connected with the nature. And uh, so, how the women can, uh, women behaves with the nature, how uh, like uh, nature and women are the same part of uh, the life behaviors. Uh, she performs this. Hmm. I'm having a little problem here with the um, images not yeah, showing. Yeah, let me see if I can reload the page. <clears throat> yeah, let me see if yeah. I can. Okay, so it went back to the beginning. For some reason, it's not. Uh, I think Zoom and, uh, and Google Slides are not cooperating. Hmm. Let me see here. In the Salim also, it's a renowned oh. the, the, the performance artist of India. He did the performance of a, a, a big story of a, of a, it's a novel, uh, which is waiting for a book. And 
his performance was directly connected with the common people so this uh, washing uh, him and he talked with them about uh, 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 about the psychological you know, psychological behaviors how how people see how people look and uh, how people uh, judge the elements and this was the uh, performance uh, of in salon this is the story of a novel. And this is the performance, a group of performance by Nancy and the students of something different. Uh, I think Nancy can explain it easily. Okay. Is, uh, I concept. All right. Um, yes, so this was a performance that was developed by us as a group. It started off by uh, <clears throat> a small performance that one of the students did for class where he was a, a painting student, but he was interested in sculpting and he began to sculpt his own face while blindfolded. So he would touch his face and sculpt uh, his face uh, in clay in front of him with no sight at all. And he did this as a performance for an exercise for the class and everyone loved it. And so it was developed, that seed was taken by us and developed it um, into a group performance, which they uh, titled Pratam Sparsho, First Touch. So each of the students uh, set up in a large pavilion that was being constructed by the workers uh, while we were there to sculpt while blind and sculpt only from touch. And the people who they were sculpting were taken from the audience and the participation. So this performance was durational and it went on for about two hours. And during this time, each of the students you can see here were sculpting individuals um, who would step forward and sculpting without being able to see what they were doing. So they were touching people's faces and some of these were other artists from the, um, from the presentations in Unurum, dancers and musicians. And some of them were workers on the grounds who were constructing this pavilion. Some of them were students of the university. People came in and, uh, and sat for the students as they sculpted them. And while they were sculpting, the, and I, of course I was there as well because this was a performance we'd conceived of together, so I joined them. And one of the things that we did was students decided that they wanted another component. Uh, so they selected poems in each of their native languages from across India to read during the, the actual performance. So they would take turns reading poems that they felt um, somehow brought forth the ideas behind the piece. Some of them read poems on identity. Some of them read poems about people's physical heads. Some of them read poems on, um, on sculpture or getting to know themselves. So I'm going to play this very brief excerpt from uh, one of the students. This is, um, uh, the, this is actually the student who conceived of the idea originally, reading a poem in Bengali. So that will give you some idea of um, how the poems and the sculpture and the performance interacted. Let's see if I can go past this. There we go. 
So at the end, we ended up with multiple sculptures that we then left in the place uh, where we made them. So it was a site specific work as well. And one of the techniques that came into uh, that emerged was sculpting a head, almost like the Janus head, which was quite amazing in Roman culture on the coins. Um, you had people sculpting multiple heads from the same piece of clay. So you had two or more faces on the same um, piece of clay as an object that was left in the space. This was a really wonderful experience with the students. Um, I was very grateful that I was able to work with them in this way. And I wanted to model this very deliberately as an alternative um, to create together as a collective um, rather than have them model my performance work. Um, I wondered if maybe Dr. Imesh and I can talk a little bit about the the ramifications of this festival and its intersection with the tribal people and also um, one of the wonderful things that came out of this was um, one of the students was invited to come back to the festival the following year and make work individually as an artist. So there were connections made amongst the professional artists who were invited and among the communities that were involved in the in the festival, both the artists, the local communities and the performers and the local people and the students. So Dr. Umesh, I wonder if we could talk for a couple of minutes and we can also take questions now. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like to add anything else at the end. Um, perhaps this would be a good time, maybe if there's anything I've missed. Yeah, yes, uh, actually, uh, this aim of this festival also connected with the community. And uh, and uh, here I concentrated with the Mundari communities, which are now uh, the languages are for a tradition. We don't know uh, any text of this uh, Mundari tribes, so they have a, also a higher skill uh, for any craft skills. But there now there is no any um, economical value of these skills. So. This festival is uh, connected with the contemporary people and some young artists and students. However, this uh, uh, problems and anything they whatever they want to do for these communities. This is really the end of this festival. And at the same time, I also uh, want to introduce uh, in the eastern side that. Uh, how the contemporary art also connected with uh, uh, communities and like community art and, and engage with the uh, uh, nature, engage with the ecologies, engage uh, with the environmental issues. This is the aim of this uh, festival. That's all. And one of the things that I found so wonderful about this festival, Dr. Nayak, was the, the coming together of the contemporary artists and the tribal artists and the local community. Um, I know that that's something that you work with, and I was very honored that I was invited to experience that. Um, did you want to say anything about that in terms of how you work and, um, and how the festival was organized? Uh, this festival, uh, this is uh, in, uh, in my uh, organized, organized. Uh, this is the fourth uh, festival and in 2023 I also organized the same type of festival in Bhubaneswar. Now uh, I'm also uh, planning for this year the same type of festival with the, but it's uh, related to it only ecology and environments, not communities. But indirectly, we connected with the community, these are farming, these are organic farmers, and all are, uh, and which are uh, land savers, these are water uh, uh, related uh, people, which are doing uh, like and uh, work with the environment and ecologists. So this festival also 
Now I'm working on it. Uh, in 2024, December, we are planning the festival. Uh, this, this festival is not for any corporate purpose. It's only awareness and uh, uh, preserve some rare uh, uh, documents, preservation of some languages, preservation of some uh, uh, stories, poems, whatever the communities are uh, uh, con continuing in their life. Uh, now, we are just planning to make a uh, archival archive for this. Uh, this is the aim of uh, the festival is connecting with the communities and the whole uh, uh, contemporary artists and the literature person musicians, some uh, filmmakers also are going to get together. And we also are uh, planning future this will continue. And then some, uh, we also uh, start uh, to connect the students, which are, uh, those who can understand uh, the richness of this uh, communities and environments. Thank you so much, Dr. Nayak. I, I find this to be a very beautiful trajectory of your work. Um, and I know you have a lot of your work also, uh, your own fine art and your other organizing work. Dr. Nayak and I met at a, um, a the Kaladam um, Society in Delhi, where he yes. was organizing a... Um, a Flock of Art. Flock yes, of art. the Flock of Art was the four day, three day presentation of artists from all across Delhi to come together after the pandemic and present together. Uh, it was a wonderful festival where people uh, were coordinating and showcasing their own work and there were many performances that happened there. So Dr. Nayak is doing um, wonderful work across India and I'm looking forward to uh, working with him more when I return to India as soon as possible. Um, and hoping to set up a residency with him, an artist house, uh, where we can host others. Yeah. So um, I thought maybe we would just leave a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Uh, we try to keep our presentation relatively brief because I know it's the end and everyone is a little tired. So especially those who are joining us from India. So if anyone has any questions, Dr. Nayak and I can absolutely um, take questions. I, I think we've um, I, we've lost a lot of the audience. Uh, I'm sorry. It's just uh, been a, it's been an amazing um, introduction to performance art and uh, your work with uh, the tribal community. Also, thank you so much, uh, Nancy and mm -hmm. Dr. Nye for sharing this. Um, we have, um, I, I just want to know if anybody would like to do the breakout rooms at this point, because uh, we've already gone uh, longer than we had planned to. Uh, we're here to do the breakout rooms if y'all would like to um, do that, or we can wrap up. Could I just get a hand, show of hands for anybody who would be interested in doing breakout rooms? Um, Lauren and Lauren, I think you and I will have to hang out together later. Um, I'll might... talk to myself. That's okay. <laughs> no, I can chat with you. We can have the meeting open for like five to ten minutes, and who wants to stay back? This could be the breakout room. Right. Yeah. So, can I ask Nancy a question about oh, Arista? Absolutely, please, yeah. please. Uh, Nancy, there are some. Famous sites in uh, Ubaneshwar, uh, temple site. Uh, down on the coast, there's the uh, Kanarak, uh, which is a magnificent um, sculpted um, chariot, uh, many stories high, must go back a thousand or more years. Is there any way that you might in the future uh, look at those classical elements, tradition, ancient, 
and mm -hmm. factor in what you do by way of performance art, uh, somehow capturing that as part of the stage. Hope that question makes sense. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Hershey, it's very nice to meet you. Um, I, I have been to Conark. It is one of the most spe spectacular places I've ever been. Um, I'm sure Mr. Nayak uh, could tell us a lot more about it because he's a native of Bhuvaneshwar and, uh, and Odisha. So he's very familiar and he lives there. Um, he's presenting from there now. Um, I, um, it's, it's very difficult to use sites like that as, um, as sites for performance, with, especially as a, as a, as a white body person. Um, these are sites that are so integral to um, the region, the local region and the cultural identity of the place. So although I perform, my individual performance work uh, incorporates a lot of urban structures and intersection with architecture, but um, it would be difficult to perform on a, a very, very um, profound and historically and spiritually and, and culturally relevant site like that without, without reinforcing a colonialist narrative. I, I don't want to do that. And I'm very um, sensitive about how my presence in India was seen. So um, I, while I appreciate that site very much, I, I also, would defer to the people who have lived with it and who might actually have a lineage of, to the people who constructed it. I don't know if you would like to say anything about that, Dr. Nayak. Thank, thank you for the comments. Of course. Thank, thank you, Nancy. That was, uh, I personally do appreciate the respectful, uh, your respectful approach to uh, those heritage sites, um, though it would be lovely to see your work in um, some of these spaces. Uh, uh, so I, just let me, I would just like to wrap up uh, quickly. Um, thank you, Dr. Dash uh, and uh, Mega for being here today. And they are from Yusuf. Uh, thank you also to uh, the Fulbright Association for making this platform available for us, both uh, Zoom and, um, you know, uh, helping us pull this group together. It is a very critical um, time in the world. Uh, I believe we need um, to have more initiatives uh, that promote peace. Um, so D Deputy Secretary Verma um, had em emphasized in, in a recent speech, um, he'd emphasized the importance of continuing to support people to people ties through new education linkages, new efforts and research, new cultural initiatives, and even more development work in uh, a global context. And he mentioned how both President Biden and Prime Minister Modi have said that our impact with each other, uh, India is and the US is important, but what we can do for the world is even more important. Uh, and I think that's a message that we need to uh, work with. And we need to carry forward with this group. Um, by coming together as a community, um, by collaborating, and uh, you know, making those connections. I just want to share my very last slide. Um, okay, so this was... Um, Bringing in the Olympics was suggested to me by one of our board members, Lauren Hershey, and uh, for very good reason. Um, the Olympics represent uh, nations coming together, collaborating, working together. We forget our differences, um, even though we are competing against each other. 
and we rejoice in each other's um, accomplishments. Um, there, you know, we, everybody wants to win, but uh, we do acknowledge um, the art in, um, for me, uh, athletics is a performance art yeah, because you are doing your very best and you are entertaining well the, the athletes are um i have been an athlete all my life uh and i continue to um look at uh take on new challenges um i just climbed half dome and um without knowing what i was getting into um but it was uh an amazing experience in the sense that it told me that I can do things uh, that I never conceived possible. And I believe we as a group will do that. Um, somebody uh, wants to uh, ask for the vision statement and what our group will look like at the end of uh, a year. And um, everything that I have um uh, you know everything that we have offered um, as being part of our calendar and programs that we are going to um, give and offer at, on this platform uh, will be part of our vision. Uh, it might seem really ambitious, but um, we have the talent uh, to um, bring it to you and um, we hope that y'all will uh, join us in um, you know creating this community and being available and participating with us um, so our um, I just wanted to say that um, it, as a very last thing the drinks that we were drinking today were coffee water watermelon juice lemonade tea Water, warm water with cumin, hot water with lemon and honey, which essentially is hot nimbu pani, and a very brave person admits to drinking an evening drink. Um, and uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I applaud you for that um, because I was, I'm quite sure there, were, there was more than one person who was uh, having their evening drinks also. Um, but we are have come together from different um, places, uh, both geographically and um, you know on our individual journeys. Um, and we are you know drinking. Each of us has a thirst. We've got a physiological thirst, and we've got an intellectual thirst. Uh, we talked about the physiological thirst. And in you know sharing what drinks we were drinking, but it's that intellectual thirst that will um, keep us together, that has brought us here, will keep us together, and will take us forward. Um, so, if there are any more questions, anything else, anybody wants to say, we are here. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much uh, for being a part of uh, this inaugural meeting with us. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.